Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our passage comes well into uh, Luke's book of Acts. We were introduced to Saul before his conversion, uh, where he enacted a Christian uh, persecution. Paul ha has had now his conversion uh, and becomes a missionary, helping to plant and support emerging Christian communities. In this passage today, we find that he has arrived in Athens. We notice that Paul comes to Athens to meet up with and wait for his friend uh, Silas. The actual frame of the story happens while he is waiting for Silas. He's waiting in the marketplace. His surroundings are idols and their worship. Uh, all one had to do was walk down the street of the Decaminus, Decaminus Maximus, the main street, if you will, of Athens, the market street, and idols would be uh, everywhere, altars and statues, offerings and talismans for sale. Life in the Athenian world was immersed in such experience. It was normative to worship the marketplace gods. And in this, Paul sees opportunity. Paul uses an Athenian image, their own idol, an unnamed god, unnamed by intention, by obliviousness, and upon the idol, Paul paints, if you will, the revelation of God in Christ Jesus. Paul speaks to their highest selves and their searching and their seeking. Paul does not offer them religion for religion. He offers them something more. He offers them faith in God who seeks relationship with humanity, a creator God, a redeeming God. He's not interested in presenting a God competing against the demigods and lesser gods. He he doesn't even really deny their place. Instead, he uses what he has observed about his hearers and their faith in these lesser gods to speak to them about faith in Jesus Christ. And some, some of them find their stories are changed, their narratives completed. Some you see find conversion. Neil Gaiman's book, American Gods, uh, is about the many gods that we believe in and the waxing and waning of their popularity in the West. There are indeed in our world demigods and altars uh, to be worshipped, financial security, entertainment, uh, politicians, politics, partisanship. And in a moment of fire, of flood or illness, we resurrect such marketplace gods for our own use. What events like the pandemic, the physical distancing, wearing masks, etc. do is trigger in us our past stories and God-making abilities. As human beings, you see, we are creatures of memory. Uh, our past dealings with grief and crisis and fear create in us they develop in us emotional tools. We gain learned behaviors, little gods of our genuflection. Some are helpful and some are not. We carry these devised protocols with us, you see. And when fear or anxiety or events trigger uh, the recollection of these previous experiences, our coping mechanisms and our tools come to the forefront. Now, they may have been appropriate in the moment. There's no question, or they may not be appropriate, but some of these are pernicious in the moment today when we use them. Events like the coronavirus trigger the past in such a way as, as to pull us out of this immediate moment and relocate us in the time of the original events, environment, it takes us backwards. We regress, in worst case, infantilizing us, even if we're not aware of it. 
Such triggers link us to the bygone time, long ago visited place, that understanding of ourselves, and often in a powerlessness of that hour. Sometimes we are aware, and most of the time we are not. All our stories about us, that we told ourselves then, and we retell ourselves in the present, they become, if you will, misapplied constructs. The narratives that we've created at one time, we access and bring forward, often misapplying them. Human reason, you see, is not a particularly strong tool when it comes to these. Uh, when it comes to the total recall, these are not only powerful memories, you see, they're, they're powerfully emotive. Reason is so often the rider on an elephant of emotion and biological triggers catching us unaware. Moreover, psychologists know the earlier a story's origin, the more primitive its narrative script, the less our capacity to contain it. And so the more we act out our, our such primitive narratives about mommy and daddy and brother and, and what we needed at that time, but we didn't get uh, maybe how we were hurt or when we were left alone, felt shame. We will create in their wake strange behaviors and scapegoat people in the present, devise rituals and undertake unscientific solutions, but emotional ones. We don't have to look so far as the plagues or illness today or even in the yesteryear to see the mass regression to magical thinking, the resurrection of demigods and their exchange religion where you make an offering in exchange of protection for safety when the storms and lightning come of this world or to help us gain wealth or to ensure that our crops do not fail. There's not that big a difference, really, you see, between us and all the hero and demigod worshippers of ages past. But all of it makes us fugitives of our own lives in the present. And part of what has been particularly difficult for us is that we have missed our in-person gatherings, our sharing of meals together, our reminders weekly of a different uh, narrative than the one sculpted from our pain and our fear. This is where our community gatherings for the Eucharist have their most power. There is a story uh, that counteracts our own feeble attempts at God-making, uh, that is God's narrative. It's a narrative of faith ancestors and traditions, a narrative that reminds us of the trials and tribulations of people, the souls of the ancient, their wanderings with God, in whose lives we may find guiding currents which uh, run through the words, equipped by God for their moments, prepared by God for their opportunities. We discover that we are close in our little face and individually protective machinations and bargaining with the lesser God, just like all of them were. God is present with them. And we discovered that in this relationship with God, there is no exchange needed. For we see in the, our narrative of God, we learn that in God's narrative, God's presence is there before we ask because of God's desire for us, God's creation of us. God's grace is there because of God's suffering before our own. God's deliverance is there. In fiery cloud, a burning bush, and living water, and bread, and timber pierced dung heap, and upper rooms where the fearful hide, and on the road as they flee, God is present. And we learn in this story, we learn that fear and pain and suffering, and even the false dominion of death, will not have the last word. We discover in God's unsettling, uh, replacing the toppling narrative that ours is but only a fragment of God's story, a chapter um, where we have a beginning and, a, and an ending with God. The lesser stories always, always leave us. The lesser stories always leave us searching and seeking and wanting more, eager to return, you see, addicted to the marketplace gods. Uh, they are never quite transcendent enough 
poetical enough, metaphysical enough to breathe life into the narrative that we experience in the present. You see, I'm not offering you religion for your habits in exchange for your habits of coping. That is your personal religion, your unrequited love songs to your own demigods and habits of control that have worked in the past. I'm offering you faith in a God who seeks relationship with you, who made you, who loves you. An antiphonal psalm woven between you and this God where, where the God of heaven and earth answers your call out of the whirlwind with compassion, vision, and understanding, and clarity, and acceptance. God answers you and bids you hear and see. Don't you see in this moment the age of the marketplace gods has come to an end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.